me what to do to make all my luck or late dreams come true. Hello everybody, Bob Loves, the Pawn Boss. It must be Wednesday, checking in with you guys and uh, see what's going on out in your world. I had a really interesting day today. It's really actually pretty stunning. It's uh, I'm going to go over some of this list with you. I, you know, when I'm doing these things, I don't really think much about it. But at the end of the day today, I went back through my list of everything that happened. And I think some of that stuff would be pretty cool to share with you guys on this broadcast. So I want to get right to it. But you guys know the drill. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comment section. There we go. Share it to your timeline. Click like. And you're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat and a Palm Boss mug. Say it with me that knows how to keep hot things hot, cold things cold. Hey, I got a question for y'all first up. How many of you watched Carol Baskin on Dancing with the Stars earlier this week? Raise your hand. Admit it. I'm going to wait for some answers right here. Write it down. I want to hear about it. I want to hear. Uh, I want to know who did that. I got to know. It's killing me. Inquiring minds want to know. Look at there. There I can see. Now I can see who all's on here. Good deal. There's Mike Cottrell, John Funk, Danny Tolliver. Good to see Danny from over at Bells, Texas. Yep. Yep. All right. Tell me. Admit it. I want to know. I want to know who watched Dancing with the Stars with Carol Baskin on it. Hey, in the meantime... For after we get 10 people to subscribe to Palm Boss Magazine online or call into the office and either tell Leanne or put in the notes section that you subscribe from this broadcast, then you're going to be eligible for a drawing, which is a 1 in 10 chance. And you know what? I'm going to give away two of them. So 1 in 5 chance to win a cool little fishing box. Got all kinds of lures and stuff in it. This is from Texas Hunter Products. And, uh, you know, they're owned by Pradco now. And, of course, Pradco makes all kinds of cool stuff, so they're doing a little cross-marketing. So, anyway, there's that. So, if you spend that 35 bucks, remember, 35 bucks for Palm Boss Magazine, you know my deal here. You, um, Palm Boss Magazine, a Friday night date is gone and cost over 40 bucks. This is 35 bucks, and it lasts a year. So, full of good information. So, anyway, um... Okay, Dustin Crawley watched it, or maybe, no, wait, he's not owning up to it. <laughs> well, anybody that watched that, I want to scold you because that means you watched Tiger King and you watched Dancing with the Stars. What's the matter with you people? It was sad. I watched it because my wife made me. She had no idea who Carol Baskin was, and I watched Tiger King, so I knew who Carol Baskin was. Anyway... I guess I did sit down and watch it for a few minutes. I, I had to because Debbie and I hunkered down in our cabin for a couple of nights while we had some work done on the house. It was just sad. No, I didn't really watch it. Yeah, maybe I did. You shouldn't. It's terrible. Hey, I had some really, really cool things today, and I, I wrote down a list. And there it is right there. That all happened today. So I thought I'd go through some of this stuff with you because several of the folks that I talked to are actually viewers of this show. So if you've got some questions, I'll, I'll try to answer those as we go. But that's some really, really interesting things. There's John Wilson, Ron Ardlant. Ron's a man. My heart went out to Ron because he and his family got, they live in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and they were a direct hit with a Category 4 Hurricane Laura a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago now, I think. And now here comes Sally, just east of them, doing the same thing with lesser winds and a lot of rain over there to our friends in the, uh, around Mobile, Alabama. As a matter of fact, I've, I've talked to the guys at uh, American Sportfish Hatchery, and they're getting a lot of rain, but the wind is dying down where they are. But still, you know, any these hurricanes, that's crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Travis Paul Smith, good afternoon. Dion Myers, I see John again. Mark Primo, Mark was over there in that hurricane at, uh, with Laura. I haven't heard from him about what happened to him. Okay, Dustin Crawley, she heard you ask. I'm sitting on the back porch with her. I saw nothing. Yeah, good. I, I believe that. I did. There's Michael Gray checking in from Nashville, Tennessee. Vito Barnes checking in from uh, right here in Whitesboro, Texas. Robert Hudson, good to see you. Harrison Davis from Georgia. So uh, I'm going to kind of, I don't see any questions yet. So uh, I see Ron McWilliams. Ron McWilliams checking in from uh, Ransom Canyon Lake over there near Lubbock, Texas. Good to see him. He, uh, you guys need to, 
If you guys need video footage or videos shot or you know other kinds of electronic communications, Ron McWilliams is a great, great candidate to talk to. Okay, Travis Ball Smith said, I feel bad for Alabama, but glad it turned. It was headed to Gulfport, right there where your place is. Well, you know what? Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and there you go. So uh, here's what happened today. I got to talk to Wyatt Kenniger, who is a uh, firefighter in, around Denver, Colorado, who loves to hog hunt, which this is pretty funny. He, he likes to come to Texas and go hog hunting. He loves it so much that he bought a piece of property not far from Abilene, Texas, Got a small pond on it, about an acre, acre and a quarter, something like that. And we probably talked for 30 or 45 minutes, and I did most of the listening because <laughs> he is so excited about what he's doing with this pond. And so his his question is, I'm a do-it-yourselfer. I want to figure out how I can take this pond and turn it into a really fun fishing pond. You know, since he lives near Denver, it's a pretty long drive from there to Abilene, Texas, so he gets to come down maybe once every two months, sometimes every three months, sometimes a little bit more often. So he wants to set the stage for his 30 acres of land with his small pond on it to improve the habitat and to uh, make sure it's stocked properly. And uh, he's convinced there's no fish in it. And I asked him questions that made me pretty well convinced that there's no fish in it out there. So we talked about habitat and out there, one of the abundant things growing on the prairie out there are mesquite trees. So he's been cutting mesquite trees, dragging them into the pond, creating habitat, and he sent me a picture of what sure looks like hydrilla. Now, I've been doing this over 40 years, and I have seen hydrilla in private waters that I've, I've been involved in two times. Two times. And one of those times, the guy planted it, and I fired him. <laughs> uh, that, that, that plant, even though anglers love it, if you have to live with it, it's not such a good plant. So I asked him to send me some up-close pictures so I can identify the plant. So job one is to identify the plant. But job two is to help him figure out a good stocking protocol to achieve the goals that he has set. And his goals are, are they're very reasonable. It's how can I stock this pond, maybe put a feeder on it that will have enough feed in it to last two months or three months during the, the growing season where I don't have to come fill the feeder up. So we talked about Texas Hunter feeders, we talked about Purina MVP, and one question he asked me was, now I don't understand the differences in all these different feeds. He says, Purina's got this big long lineup and they all have different numbers. How do I know what to do? Well, with the, I, I, I mean, I kind of take some of that stuff for granted, so I didn't really think about it until he asked me that. But for those of you that need to know, want to know, MVP, is multivariable particle. That's what that stands for. So there's nine different pellet sizes in that fish food that's designed to feed anything from little bitty bluegill to, to larger bluegills and fish that are trained to eat fish food like hybrid striped bass, uh, feed trained bass, if you've got those. Now, a bass won't necessarily learn to come eat fish food, but if they've been conditioned to eat fish food as babies, then they'll be more likely to come to that fish food. So he uh, he was telling me that uh, he couldn't didn't know whether it about 500, 600, 400 pounds or whatever. So most of the numbers are associated with the size of the pellet. Now 400 doesn't mean 400 millimeters or anything like that. It's just the the names that they have in their inventory list that as you start using these different feeds, you begin to learn what they mean. Uh, I'm going to go down the line here and make sure I don't get too far behind. Let's see. Uh, Gerald and Candace Davis, Robert McDonald, what temperature should you stop feeding largemouth bass when they quit eating? That's going to be, they're going to let you know. All the fish that are on fish food, they'll, they'll get real, real sluggish as the water temperatures drop. And at some point, their activity will drop to the point where they're not, not even coming up for the fish food. That's a good time to quit. Now, if you want to feed bluegill, you know, just cut the feeder way, way, way back. I wouldn't turn it off over winter unless you get ice. If you get ice, shut it off. But bluegill will feed down in when the temperature's down into the 40s. So uh, I tend to want to feed just a tiny little bit of uh, fish food to feed those bluegill. There's Gerald Davis. Hey, you know, Gerald, I got to talk to Gerald earlier this week. He's got a weedu cutting boat for you guys in East Texas if you're looking for some help getting rid of abundant plants. Gerald Davis is doing it. Friend him, he's Pristine Ponds is the name of his business. There's Jacob West checking in from Denison, Texas, I bet you. 
Chance Burke survived Sally. Wow, good for you, man. I tell you, anytime I see a hurricane, my spine shivers, and I'm just fascinated with weather as it is and, you know, just seeing how these things are going to go. I hope hope nobody gets complacent because, man, I've been through a hurricane before, and even though the hurricane is exhilarating and there's no way I would stay for one like Laura or even like Sally. When those winds are over 100 miles an hour, you know, think about getting hit with a fastball in the face going 100 miles an hour. Well, that's what a two by four whacking you at 100 miles an hour is going to feel like. So, uh, anyway, even though it's kind of a thrill to go through the hurricane, the aftermath is there's not one thing thrilling about that to not have power or water or any of that stuff. Okay, uh, here we go. Jacob West needs his. You know what, Jacob, you're going to like some of this stuff that I'm going to talk about here in a minute. Let's see, Ron, see what Ron says. Ron says. I'm more upset about not being able to go to the Pondology Institute. <laughs> well, you know what? It got Laura, let's see, okay, then my house gets, but luckily my house is still standing. A lot of people lost everything. It's really sad and I pray really hard. You know what? And I know you do. You know, I, I know you do, Ron. And, you know, going through what you guys have gone through, it's it's traumatizing. It's memorable. And I know the people at Lake Charles are going to come through it. It's just going to take a long time to get completely recovered from it, and you guys will be fresh and new and exhausted all at the same time. Let's see what else we got down here. Good evening, Chuck Brinkman, Jeremy Duckworth, Chris Chavetta checking in from St. Louis, David Schneiderman, Easy Docks of Texas. I referred a guy to you yesterday, David. You and I need to have a conversation. I think I've got a fish feeder for you too, by the way. Okay, so I wanna go through this list. My day started off down south of Dallas this morning. Yes, I got to go drive through Dallas rush hour traffic today. And there's a uh, an old, old, ancient oxbow lake off of the Trinity River on a tributary of the Trinity River. And when you start talking about Dallas and south of Dallas and the Trinity River, you know, the city of Dallas, their wastewater treatment plant gets effluent that's cleaned up, gets dumped into the Trinity River. Well... The majesty of water, it's its just magnificent because it cleanses itself enough that Houston drinks it downstream. And we all live downstream. You know, so what we can do to make lakes better and make water better, that's part of our role as stewards. So I went and met with this fishing club, hunting club. It's called the Dallas Hunting and Fishing Club. They've got a 130-acre oxbow lake that actually was dammed up to elevate the depth of it some decades ago, but that's an ancient lake. Well, it's just a big bowl of milt and, I mean, milt, um, silt and muck, and they want to explore what it would take to renovate some of that lake, but they're, they had, they, they started me off with a budget. With, with the budget that they set, I said, you know what, you can't renovate the whole lake for this, but what we can do is we can take a key part of the lake, probably 25 or 30 acres of that lake, and we can turn it into prime largemouth bass habitat. So I threw a little proposal out there to them to present to the club, and the club members started raising their hands saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, why don't we renovate the whole lake? And the guys said, you know, because we don't have the budget. And they started saying, well, we'll kick in a little bit more, and I'll kick in a little bit more, and I'll kick in a little bit more. So today's meeting was to begin to talk to some earth movers to start to figure out what will it take to renovate this 130-acre lake? Well, first of all, they're going to have to drain it. Well, immediately downstream, water from this lake serves to flood some uh, paddies, some artificial, cool wetlands that you guys would love, which the wetlands help to cleanse the water even more before the water flows on into the Trinity River so Houston can drink it. You know, so they've got it set up for duck hunting, waterfowl hunting. They want to take this lake and make it a great fishing lake. So we spent a couple of hours this morning working on that, trying to figure out what we need to do. Well, here's the conclusions we came to. We're going to have the lake mapped with side scan sensitive enough sonar uh, by Hummingbird, I believe it is, that can, that can detect the depth of loose soils compared to where it meets up with hard pan clay down beneath those loose soils. From that, we can project about how much silt and muck is in that lake, and from that, we can start to come up with some costs or in methods as to what it's gonna take 
after the water's off of it to start figuring out how to move that dirt and rearrange the bottom of that lake to get more depth, excavate some dirt to get it out, and create some really cool fish habitat. So now the club's leaning toward renovating maybe two-thirds of the lake if they can come up with that budget. And there's just a couple of those guys with pockets deep enough that they might just say, let's renovate the whole lake. So that's pretty cool. Let's see. Now, and what I told them was, as we, uh, as we um, look at renovating that lake, if we were to take 25 or 30 acres, one, one, here, here's a key point everybody needs to know. And, and almost every single pond or lake, 90% of the fish are going to reside in 10% of that lake at any given time. So the way I came up with 25 acres, if it's a 130-acre lake, 20% of that lake is 26 acres. Why don't we take 26 acres and make that prime habitat and attract fish that are produced from all over the lake and bring them into that prime habitat so we can congregate them into areas that fish prefer? So that's how this thing, that's the genesis of this thing, based on their budget. Now, if they had a bigger budget, we'd be talking, we would have been talking about something different. But that's the budget that we started with, so we'll see. You know, and so now we'll go, uh, we'll, we'll get that map and start looking at the potential for other parts of the lake. The far side of the lake has got, it's all, it, it looks like something that you'd see in far east Texas, um, maybe even parts of Louisiana with a lot of button bush. There's a lot of, uh, uh, there's no pine trees like you'd see in East Texas, but they got a lot of elm trees and oak trees and things like that. It's, it's a typical riparian floodplain. That's what it is. So there's some areas over there where we can topple a few trees into the lake and add some fish attraction structures and things. So anyway, we talked about that. There's Wayne Lancaster checking in. Good to see Wayne. Kirk Glamoury checking in. Matt Glamoury checking in from Dripping Springs. Hey, we had an RV at Dripping Springs out at Cottonwood Creek for a long time. I say a long time, for about a year and a half. We loved it. Uh, Todd Austin, I asked about adding hybrid stripers in my largemouth bass pond. Should I restock every three years? <clears throat> yeah, I think I'd restock every three years, maybe every every two years. Where I was going a while ago with that 10% of the, or 90% of the fish live in 10% of a lake, that leaves 90% of a lake that's open. And so in this lake, with this big, wide expanse of, of fairly shallow water, that's not bad for hybrid striped bass. So I was telling these guys today, you know, we could do some hybrid striped bass as well as having this perfect habitat for largemouth bass, bluegill, and, you know, we could even create some crappie habitat in a lake like that because it's plenty big enough. You know, so that's going to be kind of fun. Jeff Thompson, building a new one-third acre bluegill hatchery pond this month. Ideal depths and would you lime it? I would lime it if my soils are acidic, a one-third acre bluegill pond, ideal depths, I'd say shallow it, the shallow end, four feet, the deep end, uh, at six feet. That's plenty deep, as long as you've got a source of water for it. Be sure you can drain it. Have it, have it high enough on the, you know, on the ground where you can fill it with water that you pump in, if you can. If you depend on runoff, that's okay. But you would need to be able to drain all the water out of it. It needs to be rectangular. So you can sane it with the sane, pull the net, you know, the length of the pond and catch a whole bunch of fish at one time. So it needs to be three to one slope down to the bottom, flat, with a grade going from four feet to six feet deep from the shallow end to the deep end with a drain in the bottom of the deep end so you can get all the water out of it. There you go. Let's see here. Step one, map the lake. <laughs> we, uh... There's going to be an article in the next issue of Palm Boss Magazine that Mark McDonald wrote, the founder of Palm Boss, about Ransom Canyon Lake where Ron lives. And the all the discussion, those guys are, are, are highly energized and excited because we analyzed the lake and found a whole lot of carp and gizzard and shad in that lake. And you can read about it in the next issue of Palm Boss. But the first thing we told them to do is map the lake. Ron says, we've had many fish kills in lakes and ponds. Most ponds that were in the path of the hurricane have turned to beautiful black, clear water. Planktonic algae blooms were killed. Filamentous algae is blooming like crazy. I'm assuming from all the nutrients from dying tree plant. Yep, that, yep. You know what? When you have a hurricane like that that blows through, it completely disrupts, disrupts everything ecologically. It disrupts wetlands. It disrupts trees. It disrupts lawns. You know, it disrupts your swimming pool, your dad's swimming pool, because it's full of trees and leaves and stuff now. 
You know, and ponds are ponds are not exempt from that because when you get three times the volume of water coming into the pond that currently exists in it, it's going to completely disrupt the the status quo of the biology of that pond. And the consequences are the water is going to be shocked by that. And if it's shocked enough, you know, then that's going to kill some fish and it's going to kill plants. But here's the good news. Ponds are resilient and they'll rebound from that. So if there's not fish kills associated with it, then those those ponds are going to turn around and be okay. If there's fish kills, then you got to come back in, you know, on the heels of that hurricane after things settle down a little bit and analyze each pond and see what's left. You know, I'll always remember uh, Hurricane Harvey, which was in 2017, that hit Houston. There were some ponds that had 20 feet of water sitting on top of them, sitting on top of them. I mean, literally, wasn't flowing over them, it was sitting on them. And there were several ponds that I had the chance to analyze, and the fish structure was almost the same, except for what came in. There was some that left, but most of the key fish that were in there before the hurricane were there after the hurricane with 20 feet of water. Now, that's probably an exception to the rule. You know, I mean, I'm going to say it's very likely an exception to the rule because I did sample a couple of ponds that weren't anything like they were before that much water sat on them. So, uh, that's crazy. Let's see here. Um, The issue, okay. Yep, hey, there's Ben Cassically. Good to see you, Ben. Yeah, the water may not be so happy right now, Ron says. Yeah, no kidding. Um, let's see here. Let me make sure I got everything here going on. Cause I got more to tell you. Virginia, Debbie was, uh, <laughs> Debbie was talking to, um, Jackie Hughes tonight. And you're, 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 I heard, as I was walking out to come do this show and I heard your name mentioned a couple of times. There's Josie. Hola, we're together. Woo-hoo! Friday night date. I mean, a Wednesday afternoon date together. That's great. So excited you ordered eight subscriptions for friends and family. Holy cow, guess what? Guess what? You just won one of these right here. You just won one, eight, eight subscriptions. And I know you got it because of this. So uh, I'm going to tell Leanne to be sending you one of these. Everybody else need any up. Let's go. 35 bucks a year. You can't, you can't not do it. Okay, so now the next thing I'm going to tell you about, I told you about Wyatt. With, he's got a 1.1 acre, 1.2 acre, something like it, maybe an acre and a half. And so uh, he's um, lived, lives in Colorado, bought a place near Abilene, Texas, because he loves to hog hunt. He didn't buy a hog farm, but he bought a, a feral hog travel path. So that's part of his deal is he loves to shoot those wild pigs that live out there in that part of Texas. Special thanks to Leanne. She was so sweet. Glad. Yeah, if it wasn't for Leanne, my whole world would be upside down because with this big list of stuff that happened today, if I didn't have her helping me track this, I'd forget about some of it. I'm going to tell you about another one. I got a call from actually a neighbor not far away from here. I'm going to leave him nameless because I didn't ask him if I could talk about this. But he called me. He says, hey, I lost some fish after this last rain. And he says, now my pond's got a real musty uh, smell to it. And it's a pretty nice size lake. It's about six or seven acres. And so um, I ran over there today after I got back from Dallas. And sure enough, he had a pretty big blue-green algae bloom. And he was telling me that he thinks it's because on one of the neighboring livestock farms that they haven't been disposing of their waste properly. They've been piling it up in a watershed. And with this big rainfall, it breached a dam, washed a bunch of that hot animal waste downstream, and he suspects that's what causes problem. I kind of suspect that that's what causes problem too. Because it looked like blue-green paint has stained the shoreline downwind at the at the at the our winds have been out of the north and the east the last few days after this cold front, and it looked like green paint had been splattered on the water and the shore coming up where his lake was up. So definitely, I saw blue-green algae, and then as I was looking in the water all the way around the lake, you can see little bitty chunks of green in there, which is planktonic algae. So we're going to capture a sample of that and preserve the algae. Now, this is things you can do if you want. Uh, Our good friend Bill Cody in Malinta, Ohio, is a microbiologist, and we'll take a little pill bottle sample of water with a good tight lid because the mailman doesn't like wet mail. And you put a a couple of drops of betadine in it, and that preserves the algae intact. 
and we can ship that to him overnight, and then he'll look at it under the microscope and do algae counts and tell us what we've got. And he is an expert at that. And when we know the counts, which is X number per milliliter or X number per whatever the hell he does, when we get those counts back, we can compare those to normal and then begin to deduce just exactly what's going on with that water at that time. But I'm pretty sure this guy lost a few fish. He also lost two cows. Two cows. So if that's due to blue-green algae, which it could be, very well could be, then he's going to be approaching the neighbor saying, hey, you know, I need a little relief from this, and here's what we figured out scientifically that we've got this, and we've never had that before, before your dam burst and caused some problems with some uh, liquefied animal waste. So, got to do that today. Got to talk to uh, David White, who lives in Fort Myers, Georgia. Recently moved there from Indiana. And he's bought some property on a, in a homeowners association on a, where they've taken a bunch of uh, reclaimed gravel pits and turned them into neighborhoods. So his mission is to how to work with the homeowners association. Now, this is a pretty good size lake. It's 300 acres plus, and there's four or five lakes in this, in this HOA. So uh, he's an avid fisherman, ardent outdoorsman, conservationist, and he wants to learn what it would take to make those lakes better. So our conversation then was to talk about how to work with those in authority, you know, the Florida Game and Fish Commission, uh, the Property Owners Association managers, local pond management companies. And so what he's trying to do is figure out how to collaborate with everybody to come together and bring me in as a consultant to help them figure out the status of the fishery and then how to take that fishery and turn it into a much better fishery. So what that means is we do some water chemistry analysis. We'd be looking at habitat for, for the fish. We'd be looking at the population structure of the fishery. Uh, that means electrofishing, and there's a bunch of deep water, so that also means other sampling techniques, you know, such as gill nets, nighttime electrofishing, you know, things like that. Then we come up with what kind of food chain do they have compared to this fish population structure? And then what's a good management strategy to take it from where it is to where they want it to go? So that was a pretty good conversation today. Um, also uh, popped in and, and uh, made a phone call today to a guy outside of Van Alstine uh, that I learned. I, I do wood carving classes on Tuesday nights just to do fun stuff and and uh, I'd heard about a guy that lives over near Van Alstein that's got a small pond, and he said he had a blue-green algae problem. So I popped in to see him, and he'd been online, University of Google, like a lot of people do, and he'd come to the conclusion that he had a blue-green algae problem, and he was scared that all of his fish were going to die. So I popped in to see him. He had five inches of rain last week, like almost everybody here did. Well, he didn't have one ounce of blue-green algae. He had American pondweed, which is the farthest thing from blue-green algae that there can be. It's a rooted plant, you know, with leaves on it, little seed pods that stick up. So looking at that, I was able to reassure him that there's nothing wrong with that. He said, well, my grandson can't fish in it. And I said, you need to teach him how to be a better angler because that's some of the best plants that, that you can have in a pond. So let's see here. Um, if you guys ever fish with rage tails, uh, they're sold through Strike King, I believe, Steve Parks, they call him Big O. Steve called me today, and he's been building his own lake not far from Abilene, Texas. So we got to have a conversation because he's finished the lake and got a little bit of rain in it, and he wants to talk about peripheral habitat and then a stocking plan. So I'm going to run out and see him probably Friday and just to kind of catch up and see what's going on with the structure because he sent me a picture. He's got some really good rock habitat around the perimeter, but it looks like he's going to flood way too much mesquite thickets out there. He's at southeast of Abilene. So we're going to look at that and see what's going on. Let's see here. Let me go back down here. I want to make sure we got everything. Um, I have an older book, Kirk McGlamory, an older book by Keith Jones called Knowing Bass. Are you familiar with it? Yes, I am familiar with it. That's a pretty daggum good book. I, haven't, I actually kind of forgotten about that, but that's a pretty good book. Keith Jones has, brings up some really good points in that book. Robert Hudson, been feeding my two-year-old bluegills Aquamax all year, and they're getting chunky. Very pleased with the results so far. 
Speaking of Purina, there's Tim Jackson. Tim Jackson lives over in South Carolina. He's a big Clemson fan, so he's riding on cloud nine the last couple of years. Tim works with or for Purina Mills, so good to see Tim going on there. Good to see him. Ronnie Mack says, uh, can we clone Bob? I'm pretty cloned right now. <laughs> Too many legs for one guy. Yeah, you know what? I'm willing to take on some people to mentor. And uh, all kidding aside, if you guys, if some of you guys want to try to make a living at this, now I'm not going to pay you to come work for me. I don't mind you paying me to teach you what to do. You know, because I'm kind of at that stage. I'd be happy to start taking on some people to mentor if you guys want that. I've been doing that with Ron Ardwan, son. Let's see here. Um, let me see here what we got. Wyatt. There you are. Wyatt, I already talked about you, buddy. Already talked about you. So uh, you'll have to, at the end of the show, go back and start over and listen. I talked about you first. Bill Russell checking in from War Torn South Alabama. Man, hang in there. Hope, I can't believe you're sitting here watching this on 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 uh, Facebook while the winds are blowing your house down. You must have a brick house like the three, three little pigs, right? Matt Singley had an accident with my table saw a couple of months ago. And lost a finger and almost all my thumb. I've been down and out about it, but having Palm Boss Magazine, a couple of your books, and going back and watching all your videos on Facebook has got me back on my feet. All right, Matt, I did not know that that happened to you. Why don't you call me? I tell you what, send me a private message with your phone number. I want to ring you and talk to you and kind of help encourage you because I, I can't imagine going through that. You know, so uh, yeah, I've got I missed you as well. So holler at me when you get a chance. Yep, Wyatt, check it out, buddy. All right, so now let me go back down through my list. Um, Joel Bed, yeah, Joel Bedgood, who lives over in Sherman, he and his family have got a hunting ranch that they bought years ago up in Oklahoma that's about, an, oh, maybe not even an hour's drive from Sherman in Oklahoma, and they want to build about a five or six acre lake. They got a perfect site to do that, and so he's been going through his due diligence of designing a dam and then um, figuring out well, how much dirt it's going to take. And I helped him do some preliminary work. I don't design dams, but I'm going to collaborate with Joel to help him design some of the best habitat inside the main body of the lake once they get the dam going. So what I'll do there is go help him figure out, uh, and here's the process. The dam is going to be sitting there. So we got to site the dam first. Then we got to get the earth mover to begin to figure out what it's going to take. How much dirt? What kind of core trench? Michael Gray, if he's still on here, he's going like this, nodding his head saying, yep, that's right. Yep, that's right. So when you're getting ready to build a pond or a lake, process number one is to figure out how to build a dam. And the dam's job is to hold water, impound it, capture it, impound it, and then to release excess water in an orderly fashion. That's what a dam does. Now, behind that dam is a living, breathing entity that's going to be the lake or the pond. That's where we go in and we figure out where's the shoreline going to be. We, shoot, we can do that with a laser level and set some flags so you can begin to see that horizontal plane that's going to be water. And then we can start looking just above the water line. We probably don't want to take out very many trees unless we need shoreline access right there. You know, and then what we're going to do below the water line. You know, it's, it's a lot of guys are under the misconception that, that you can just flood a bunch of trees and call it good. Well, first of all, fish don't live up in the top of a tree sticking 30 feet out of the water. And odds are, if you knocked it down there, they're probably not going to use it there. So there's some strategy as to where we want to put different kinds of habitat because we want to take into consideration all the different life stages of all the different species of fish. Like with Wyatt, Wyatt needs spawning beds for his bluegill to reproduce. Well, he's in a part of Texas where the water level is going to fluctuate from evaporation. Out there in Abilene, Texas, he's going to have probably 90 inches of evaporation as a maximum, 60 as a minimum. So he's going to lose five feet of water through the course of a year. Now, as long as he's got enough runoff coming when those rains come, because the average annual rainfall out around Abilene, I'm going to guess, is probably 25 to 26 inches a year. So if enough of that runs off to make up for that evaporation deficit, then he's going to be okay. But you need spawning beds at different levels so that when the lake rise or pond rises and falls, those fish can have places to spawn. Now, they're going to spawn on hard pan dirt. They'll spawn on gravel. I told him to go buy a bunch of uh, pea gravel up at the a landscaping place or go to Home Depot there in Abilene and get some. <clears throat> you know, the good thing is he's also got some mesquite trees that he can cut with a chainsaw and drag out there and bundle them together and make some brush piles to attract baby bait fish. 
bigger logs if you can move them. So we had a little pause there because I started getting a call. Let's see here. I'm going to look down here in just a minute. Um, see what we got here. Stormy Lee says, hey, Bob, the perch, hatch perch hatchery pond is rocking and rolling. Them things grow fast and little perch everywhere. Maybe it's that Texas 100 feet or an MVP. Okay, so you got some bluegills in. Now, when you say perch, and there's somebody from Indiana or like John Wilson checking in from Ohio, they're going to think perch. And they're yellow perch, but you've got bluegills. Uh, Kurt McGlamry says, is Kara a grass or an algae? Is it good bass and bluegill habitat? Kara is actually an algae, but it's, 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 um, it's not a filamentous algae. It's not a single cell. It's a brushy, bushy algae that feels crunchy and crispy, smells like a skunk or musky smelling, that typically only grows about 8 or 10 inch thick on the bottom of a pond. People think it's a problem because the water drops down to it, then it looks thick and dense and like it's in a problem. So it's a, it's a branched algae that's got, um, and if you pick it up and look at it, you can see it feels real crispy. You throw it out of the bank and you let it dry, it turns solid white because it only grows in hard water. So it's got a lot of calcium carbonate in it. Is it a good uh, bass and bluegill habitat? It's real good habitat for little bitty fish. And the part of the reason it's good for little bitty fish is it's dense enough the little fish can get in it, but it also harbors lots and lots of insects. If you'll get a rake and pull some of it out, and break it up, you'll probably see eight or ten bugs in it. And that's what those fish love. Chris Chivette is still trying to build back our forage base in our lake. Any species we should consider for stocking this fall or wait till spring? Golden shiners, you can usually get at a pretty good price this time of year. So if you want to buy some golden shiners, now where Chris lives out uh, west of St. Louis, they've got a bunch of lakes on that place. And Chris is talking about one that's probably a little bit over uh, 250 acres, 260 acres if I remember right. But a pretty good bang for your buck to re... It says the key word here is rebuild. Rebuild the food chain. <clears throat> now, if you want to stock some this fall, that's a good idea. But if you want to... Now, here's this is an important deal, guys. If you're going to stock golden shiners next spring, get them before they spawn. They're only going to spawn one time. If you buy them after the spawn, you're 11 months away from seeing them spawn again. But if you buy them like in February or March... Before they spawn in Arkansas, which is where they're coming from, then you can get a spawn in your lake with them, and that's a real important deal. Harrison Davis, Karis the Branch tells you, that's right, I like it for cover. Okay, so, you know what? Hey, oh, golly, man, I'm talking so fast. 35 bucks a year, guys. Got to do my commercial. <laughs> Got to help pay the bills. 35 bucks a year. And if and, and Wayne and Josie's already won one of these, so there's one more available. And you know what? If we get 10 other subscriptions... I'll still make two of these available, but you got to, in the notes, when you subscribe to the magazine, say, hey, I saw the show, and that makes you eligible for a drawing. We'll give away two of them. I've got, I think, I think I've got five of these things total. <clears throat> and also, if you'll click like, hashtag Palm Balls Magazine in the comments section right there. Share it to your timeline. You're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Balls hat. Pretty good hat. I'm here to tell you, Ron's got one. Jacob's got one, and a Palm Boss mug that knows how to say it, Jacob. Knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. We don't know how it knows, but it does. So here we go. All righty, Micah Jefferson has not gotten his issue yet. You know, I got to tell you, I'm going to run off on a little tangent here. We had some folks that didn't get their July-August issue of Palm Boss for 41 days. The post office has gotten behind with... You know, the, with people being hunkered down and shopping online, well, you buy that stuff and it comes through the post office most of the time. So they've gotten behind, and with the controversies and things, they got they got really far behind. Now, the September issue, September-October issue of the magazine, Palm Boss, was mailed, I think, on July the 23rd. We started hearing from people that got it by September the 1st. But don't be surprised if, if you haven't gotten yours yet, because here we are on the 16th. And it wouldn't surprise me if you haven't gotten your September, October issue yet. But I promise you, we mailed it on time. It's in the hands of the post office. All right, so I've talked about Big O. I've talked about the Dallas Hunting and Fishing Club. Um, talked about Joel Bedgood. Talked about Wyatt. Talked about Florida. Talked about the local guy with the algae. Talked about the guy from Van Alstine. Larry Hensley called me today. And I love Larry because he calls me and... And he's always got some kind of a fascinating 
circumstance with his pond, always. And he called me and left a message over the weekend. He says, man, I've got some of these things that look like a, uh, they look like a brain or like a weird grayish colored jellyfish stuck to the, stuck to the dock legs. And I see some of them growing on wood. <laughs> so I called him today and he, uh, and he said, yeah, I found out what those are. They're Bryzens. I said, Larry, they're Bryzoans. B-R-Y-O-Z-O-A-N-S. Look those up. They're pretty cool. But low, uh, um, uh, Bryzoans are kind of a cross between a plant and an animal that filters their food from the water. They, they're, they can't move, but they can expand where they are as long as they've got food. I have never seen a Bryzoan in unhealthy ponds. And I have seen them disappear from ponds that have been disrupted by something like a flood event, like a hurricane, or something else that changes the quality of the water. They can only live in clean water. So I let him know that that was an indicator species, kind of like a canary in a coal mine. So as long as they're growing and thriving, they're helping cleanse the water, but they're also a symbol of good, healthy water. That's good to know. Let me see here. Who else I got? Oh, 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 here's something you guys will find really, really interesting. Well, I'm going to save that one. I'm going to go. I've got one more on my list here. Um, I've been I've been talking for about three months with a guy that is firmly convinced that his fish were poisoned by a neighbor. Now, here's the story. <clears throat> he lives down near Corsicana, Texas, or has a place down near Corsicana, Texas. And the city of Dallas had started processing their water wastewater treatment plant solids to where they're processed with water and then turned into a solid then composted and then pulverized and offered for use as a fertilizer. Well, his neighbor took some of that on to fertilize a hay pasture. So in theory, it sounded like a pretty good deal. Well, but when you start thinking about that, I, you know, I, I can hear you guys going, ew, ugh, nobody wants that. Well, you know, it wasn't like that when people ate it. You know, so where, <laughs> where I'm going is I, I do have a few concerns about things like that because there's, there's things that get dissolved in water like estrogen uh, that can disrupt a fishery. Uh, there's evidence of that in Chesapeake Bay where wastewater effluent being into, coming into Chesapeake Bay have with, with, with birth control pills, basically, that they can't extract from the water that affects the fecundity. And it's, it's, I don't want to get into it that much because it doesn't have much to do with pond management, but it can affect the sex of fish in certain quantities. Well, this guy was a little bit worried that a big rain from this hay pasture that had this composted broken down what was left of human waste put onto his hay field when it rained, ran into his lake and his hatchery pond, and he had a fish kill in the hatchery pond. And his big lake turned into pea soup. So he's considering litigation, and he wants me to come down there and analyze the lake. Now here's the problem. That happened three years ago. And he's been stewing over it, thinking about it, contemplating it, worried about it, and his biggest problem is he can't get it out of his head. So I'm going to go down there Monday and see if I can figure out the health of his fishery. And deep in my heart, you know, I, I can't imagine something that happened three years ago continues to impact the lake. Now, the guy stopped the practice of using that fertilizer. <clears throat> but, I, you know, I mean, of course, the biologist in me is, is, is wondering is, is that organic or is it inorganic? And what's the difference between putting anhydrous ammonia or, or chemical fertilizers on there? Is, is there a difference? You know, so the, um, let me see what the other one is here. Oh, oh, oh this is going to be pretty fun. <clears throat> I've been talking to a guy uh, out southeast of Lubbock and Ron, Ron McWilliams is on here. There's a guy down, there's a guy that lives in Lubbock that has a, I think he's a fourth generation ranch owner. His great grandfather bought this ranch and, and, and it's been in the family since then. There's about a 20 acre lake on it and there's a thousand acre watershed. Now, post Texas, 
gets, I think, 20 inches of rain a year on average, which when you average it, that means some years they get 10, some years they get 30. But they get an average of 75 inches of evaporation. So the ranch owner 25 years ago had this dam renovated, had it raised up so he could have a bigger lake. Well, now he's got water 35 feet deep when the lake is full right in front of the dam. But the other 15 acres or whatever it is, is shallow. It's um, uh, water maybe two to three feet deep. And so they have, that's, that, that, that's, this is right off the cap rock adjacent to the high plains. So they have hot, dry days and fairly cool nights in the summertime. But their evaporation rate is so high that it can surpass it can surpass half an inch of, of uh, evaporation a day out there. <clears throat> well, when you've got you know four or five acres that's thirty five feet deep when the lake is full, and you've got fifteen acres that's three feet to four feet deep, that water can heat up and expedite evaporation rates. So what we what we talked about today was can we take that lake and go in with some heavy equipment, keep the footprint the same to cover twenty acres, but change the slopes to three to one slopes down about three feet and then do a stair step and then three to one again and make it look kind of like an upside down wedding cake to where we've got 10 to 12 feet of depth all the way up each each cove which there's two little feeder creeks that feed it and if we had eight to 10 to 12 feet of water up there tapering down to that 35 feet of water at the deep end and we do the three to one and then do a ledge, we can put spawning beds, fish habitat, cover structure, and then do it again down at about nine feet deep, then do it again down at about 12 feet deep. So just imagine an upside down wedding cake with the little bitty piece with the two people standing on top, that's gone, flip it over. <clears throat> Where we can have a lake that when it's full is about 20 acres and if, when it evaporates 36 inches, now it's about 16 acres. When it evaporates down about five or six feet, now it's 14 acres, but never gets any smaller than about 14 acres and still has eight to 10 feet of, of water in it. So that's what we're looking at doing there, which he's really excited about doing that. So what we did was ask an earth mover, the earth mover that, that recommended him to me, recommended him to call me, had him go dig a few test holes. And what I wanted to see was, is, is can any of that water being gone, be attributed to seepage. So he went and dug four test holes in the bottom of the uh, of that lake and down below a foot, it's solid clay down to eight feet deep. So that pretty well confirms that there's not gonna be any seepage, any seepage loss. So what we're doing is we're contending with evaporation. So the mission there is to figure out, can we mitigate evaporation enough to keep the lake going from 20 acres to four acres. So if we can do that, how do we do it? Well, we do that by adding some depth to the water to keep that water from getting so hot so fast because you know if you think about it out there in the summertime, <clears throat> the water might be 95 degrees in the afternoon and it might be 82 degrees in the early in the morning. Well, that's stressful for fish anyway. So he's, he's committed to looking and doing the due diligence so what it now boils down to is how much dirt do we have to move and where can we put it? So that's going to be the next due diligence. So I'm going to sit down and draw out some contour maps, do some math on how many cubic yards of dirt need to be either moved or rearranged. Now, if we rearrange it, he's going to give up surface area because we're going to build some peninsulas and some spits and make the shoreline <coughs> come out a little bit further. So, hey, there's Bruce. Hey, Bruce, checking in. See Clark Cole. Let me scroll back up here. I'm out of topics. I busted through those faster than I thought I would. Let's see here. Okay, I'm gonna back up, back up, back up. Let's see here. Connie Bingham, Fred Bingham got his yesterday. So that's today's the so that's on the 15th is when Fred got his magazine. That is <coughs> 22 days after we mailed it. 22 freaking days. Harrison Davis says, what do you mean about clean water, Mr. Lust? No pollutants, no excess nutrients. No, what I mean by clean, actually, when I say clean, uh, I want you to understand healthy. 
When I say happy water, the term I've come up with that I use all the time is happy water. I like water to be happy. So what that means is that it can support life with the minimal amount of stress, that it's autonomous without great changes through the course of the day. Now, here's what that means to everybody. If you have water that's a, a pH of, uh, say, 6, and you have zero alkalinity or 20 parts per million alkalinity, and you've got 20% coverage of plants, <coughs> there goes my throat, and what you're going to find out is as those plants photosynthesize, they're taking up carbon dioxide, giving off oxygen, and that's also having an impact on the alkalinity. The alkalinity, or no, no, I'm sorry, doesn't have an impact. The alkalinity has an impact on that process. So when water is, uh, or when plants are respiring, they're taking up carbon dioxide, giving off oxygen. Carbon dioxide is acidic. It's going to be matching up with with hydrogen ions. So the pH is going to go up and down and up and down through the course of a day. That's stressful on fish. That's stressful on plankton. <clears throat> so that's why we like to have alkalinity, you know, higher than about 40 parts per million to help mitigate the pH ebb and flow through the course of a day just due to normal biolo biological concepts or biological activity going on in that water that's associated with plants. You know, so happy water is has got a, a healthy range in pH. pH means nothing other than it's a measurement. It's like inches. Inches means nothing. It's a measurement. <clears throat> pH is a measurement of the alkalinity and the basicity, the basis, and how alkaline the water is. If you're going to change the pH, it's because you amend the water. And typically, you amend it with lime. And the question earlier today was, uh, earlier in the show was, should I lime it? Uh, you lime it if your soil is acid. Or once some water's in it, if you test the water, see what your alkalinity is. Then you can decide what to do with it. <clears throat> so when I say clean water, I mean happy water. I mean productive water, which is water that is not stressful to everything that lives in it or to anything that lives in it. That's what I mean by that. Harrison Davis' little pond is loaded with my brains. With brains. Okay, Ken Dowd, hey buddy. Bruce, good to see Bruce. All right, Micah, could you share pictures of different habitat, bass habitat, crappie habitat, bluegill habitat? You know, one of the, when Wyatt and I were talking earlier today, I was asking him why in the world he watches this show. And as we drill down into it, he's really looking for information. You know, and I think that's probably what most people are doing is looking for information. You know, but I think some people like it because there's a little bit of entertainment because we can, and a lot of people like it because I acknowledge you. <clears throat> you know, it's kind of fun to be watching and then all of a sudden this guy here says, hey, what's going on over there, Ken Dowd? Good to see you, brother. You know, and so, uh, but I think the bottom line is information. So, Micah, what I'm doing now, and I didn't tell this to Wyatt today because I was running out of time, but uh, I've got some videos in the can that I'm going to turn into some podcasts. Now, I'm going to make it premium content because <clears throat> there's a whole lot of stuff I do that's out there for free. But this, when I when I put together a video, I got to pay somebody to do it. So I'm going to charge for that. But I'm going to, now I've got, Mike, I've got a lot of pictures of bass habitat, crappie habitat, bluegill habitat on the Palm Boss website and the Bob Lusk Outdoors website. And I'll be putting some more of that stuff up. Plus, we publish a lot of that in Palm Boss Magazine. Hey, only 35 bucks a year. <laughs> but we do, we do do some of that. <clears throat> Here, I have not yet. I'm going to get with, hey, Ron, I know you, you promised. You, I mean, I've been a little bit remiss. I need to get in touch with you so you can coach me on how to do some of these things because I'm not quite there with technology. I'm, I'm happy enough just to do this. But Ron's told me that I can do some things to make this show better. And I intend to do that when I get a minute. <clears throat> let's see here. 724. So let's see here. Ken Dowd says, I've been running my two diffuser aeration system 24-7 since May. Temperatures are cleaning off near Gettysburg. Should I start cutting back? No, don't cut back. Keep it going. <clears throat> Keep your aeration system going till the water hits 55 degrees and shut it off for the winter. I've learned so much from you the last year, Travis Paul Smith. Well, thanks, man. 
You know, one thing Wyatt told me to do today, I think, no, no, it wasn't Wyatt. It was uh, Dave White over in Florida. He said, you know, you need, and maybe it was Wyatt. I don't remember. I've talked to him. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 people on the phone today, and it's kind of hard to keep track of all that. Uh, but I was honored uh, about a month ago, and I, I think somebody's mentioned it on this show, but I got a call from Tom Lang, who I serve on a committee with Tom. Tom is the uh, director of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Freshwater Fishery Center over in Athens, Texas. And if you've never been to that place, you need to go. Now, I know they've been shut down some with the, because of Corona. They've been doing some renovation and remodeling. But if you get a chance to go there, go do that. And Tom, he is, he is a mover and shaker in the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Well, anyway, I sit on the uh, Texas Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame committee with him, and he called me one day about a month ago, a little longer, maybe six or eight weeks ago. <clears throat> and he called me up, and it was about 7.45 in the morning. He says, hey, Bob, what are you doing? Well, I thought he was calling me about Hall of, you know, Freshwater Fishery Center stuff and the Hall of Fame there. And I said, you're not going to believe it, Tom. I just shot a skunk. <laughs> he said, you shot a skunk? I said, yeah, yeah, I had a couple of teenage boys weed eating around some of my ponds there at the house and one of them texted me and said there was a skunk that looked like it was sick so I got my shotgun went around and sure enough there was a baby skunk there that was definitely sick well I I, I put it out of its misery immediately because you don't know if they're rabid you know you don't know what the sickness is we've got pets so I killed the skunk and I said that's what I did and he said well Bob I got uh Stephen Barden with me, who watches this show from time to time. Stephen's Texas Pro Lake Management Company out of Comanche, Texas. And he said, we just wanted to congratulate you. You've been nominated and accepted, and you will be inducted into the uh, American Fishery Society Fishery Section Hall of Excellence, their Hall of Fame. And I was dumbfounded. I didn't see that coming at all. And so I said, whoa, fellas, wow, I was just thinking about a skunk. And here I <laughs> am. And you guys are telling me that I'm inducted, going to be inducted into the Hall of Excellence. Well, that happened last week, and 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 I, I'm not, I'm really not comfortable talking about me. I'm really not. But uh, I've had enough folks say you need to tell people about that on this show, so I'm telling you about that, and I'm completely honored, uh, flattered by it. But I think the thing that, that that hits me the most about it is that I'm the first private sector fisheries biologist to be chosen for that. And I'm pretty excited about that. And so, uh, you know, all the others are stellar people. I mean, you, you, it's a who's who. Dr. Richard Anderson, Dave Willis, you know, uh, Dr. H.S. Swingle, who he's he developed, he did the work for Bass and Bluegill that guys like me use every day. You know, just to be considered in that group. But most of them were either professors or either professors or agency people. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of being the first private sector guy. So I wanted to share that with you as well. So, uh, you know, things are, things are rocking along pretty good. And today was probably busier than normal. Probably busier than normal, but it wasn't unmanageably busy. But I thought it'd be kind of cool to share some of this stuff with you guys you know, and, and, you know, let's just kind of hear a day in the life of what, what gets to happen to me. Cause I've got a pretty cool life and I'm very thankful for it. So Patrick Wiseman, you said turn aeration off at 55 degrees. At what depth do you measure the water temperature? Um, when the water temperature and you got an aeration system going and it's 55 degrees with an aeration system, it's going to be 55 degrees top to bottom. So when you have an aeration system and wherever your, your uh, diffusers are set, and typically even deeper than that, if they're not sitting on the bottom, you're going to have uniform temperatures top to bottom. 55 degrees as the water, remember this, as the water temperature drops, its affinity for oxygen goes up. So cooler water holds more oxygen. So, and by the time the water hits 55, most of the biological principles that are occurring and the processes that are occurring to cleanse your water are about to stop for the winter anyway. And you're going to have saturation of oxygen at 95% top to bottom. You know, so turning it off at 55 is a good time. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to look to see what's on the bottom of 729. About to wrap it up. Josie, Sean, thank you very kindly. Um, Todd Austin, thank you. Jerry Siebert. 
Hey, Bob, very smoky here. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 Jerry Siebert's up in Oregon. I don't know why you stay there. There's a lot of reasons. You've only got two or three reasons to be there, and I get that, you know. So uh, there's no way I could live in Oregon. <laughs> All right. So, you know, and I tell you what, we've got friends on here that are going through the hurricane right now. We've got friends on here that are going through the forest fires right now. You know, and, and, and Jerry's in harm's way because he lives in the mountains of Oregon. So I don't want to act callous without saying that I do care. And I know everybody in this family, we've all become a family with this group because I see a lot of guys and gals on here that are here every week. You know, and, and I still shake my head and I chuckle every time I think about Wayne and Josie because that's their Wednesday afternoon date hanging out with us on this show. So I appreciate all you guys and... Um, Clark Cole, I do appreciate that comment. And Danny Mac, Danny Mac, good to see you. So uh, you guys say some prayers for those folks going through the hard times of hurricanes and forest fires. And we're going to wrap it up, you know, and uh, I'm not sure where I will be next Wednesday, probably right here. But either way, we'll make it a point to come hang out together some more. So until next Wednesday, appreciate you guys and gals. Adios.